Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome. We're just going to dive right in. Where I sit in Red Canaries is designing and looking at researching all of that around how we train detection and response personnel. And this, what I'm going to kind of present today is just some thoughts uh, on kind of a path forward to really do two things, really enhance IR capability, but also I, I'm seeing detecting this kind of siloed approach to security. Obviously, it's something that we've had to deal with for quite a while and breaking those silos down. My background, just a little bit, uh, been in the industry a little over a decade now, been with Red Canary about two years. Prior to that, I was in law enforcement, state and federal level in cybercrime investigations. And I'm actually local here in Rapid City. So if you flew through our wonderful airport just down the road from there. This is kind of what we're going to discuss. I'm going to look at the current situation, both on a blue team side and a red team side. And when I use those terms, I use them as just kind of an overarching term for those that are going to defend a network and those that are going to test the security of a network. So when I say red and blue, that's really what I mean. So on the red side, we're talking everything from just straight up small, small time adversary emulation all the way up to full on network, uh, network penetration exercises. We'll highlight what's going on on the IR side because this is hacking the IR team. We'll talk about threat emulation and then I'm actually gonna walk through uh, really a kind of generalized training plan that you can go ahead and take to your organization and start working through. Obviously, in 45 minutes, I can't walk through absolutely everything, but it's really a construct, I think, that you can go ahead and take and build and build upon yourself. We'll have some time for questions as well. I'll be here for the next day and a half, so even if we can't get your question in right now, we'll be able to take care of it. So. This is a red and blue conversation. I have this conversation with blue teams, how to leverage red teams. I have this conversation with penetration testers and red teamers on, hey, this is some things that you might want to think about when you're talking to customers. Ideas to plant in their noodles so that they can get the best value for what you do. The amount of technical expertise in this room, in this industry is incalculable and we're leaving a lot of it on the table and you're going to hear me say that a lot i think we're leaving a lot on the table when it comes to training ir teams and that's this audience right here that's that technical that well of technical expertise here's some general observations about where we sit it's been a while since i've worked in an enterprise i hope i'm wrong but many organizations fundamentally don't understand testing and validation. This is an issue with maybe somebody is coming out of governance, risk, and compliance, and they're now in a leadership position running the security group at an organization. So they look at testing and validation as a checkbox exercise. Maybe you have somebody that is, is from legal that takes over the information security group. They fundamentally don't understand the value of testing and validation as a continual process versus a compliance exercise. This is where we get penetration testing becomes a checkbox exercise. I'm sure maybe a show of hands. How many of you walked into an engagement and it's very scoped? We just need to make sure that we don't have any issues with vulnerabilities. We just need you to show us what the vulnerabilities are. We need you to show us maybe uh, do we have some weak passwords? All we want you to do is run Responder on our network to see if, if you can capture any, any hashes traveling across the network that you can grab. Limited scope, they're scoping this, and it's turning into a checkbox exercise. This is not about the red team. This is about organizations. We also have this silo. These silos have been built over time, and I think it's time to kind of cross-pollinate a lot of what we're talking about. Again, the IR team is not leveraging the resources available. That's where this room comes in. Whether you're on the blue team or the red team, or you're or a security analyst, wherever you sit in the organization, your knowledge can help us benefit. Silo problem. If you look at what we're doing, we have a very discrete set of mission across the 
the two teams. Obviously, the blue teams want to defend, red teams want to get in, show us where we're weak, and actually do something about it. The red team, though, has this deep well of threat expertise. They know and know how to operate tools. For example, you may have access to a fully licensed uh, copy of Cobalt Strike, and you know how to work Cobalt Strike. I don't. I know what it looks like from a 4104 uh, PowerShell uh, script block, but I couldn't tell you what the actual platform looks like, what the screen looks like, and how to operate. That kind of technical expertise can help me. Working independently, this is another thing. That I've seen a lot of, of red teamers out there that two or three, te two or three small person teams can execute in excess of their weight in terms of what they're able to do independently. Two weeks penetration test or something of that nature, they have a lot of, of ability to operate independently. Some of them are kind of shady with the attacker mindset. I'm, I'm being facetious there, but shady. That's what we want. I want people that can think like an attacker. I want people that can come in and show me where an attacker would leverage this vulnerability, this misconfiguration. And of course, what do you want to do? You want to win. I love that. Winning is good. On the blue team, we have a, a threat expertise, but from almost a different perspective. If we're really good, we've got that network endpoint visibility locked down. We've got a good idea of what, what we can see. We can coordinate activity. Good IR teams are able to coordinate technical and non-technical teams to respond effectively. They're able to leverage security teams to do an investigation to determine the likely cause of initial access, lateral movement, and then coordinate with network operations and desktop operations to shut that down, contain the threat, and kick you out. We have that defender mindset. And then finally, we don't want you to succeed. It's a friendly, healthy competition, but it creates challenges for the incident response team. Here are some other things that we have on the IR side that we need to tackle. Our training is often limited to maybe an annual tabletop exercise or an on-site class for two or three days. We're gonna get what that looks like later on. As a result, we often get very limited exposure to realistic scenarios in TTPs. Unless you work for a service provider where you're doing maybe MDR, XDR, such as Red Canary, if you were in an enterprise or in a small maybe consulting role, you don't get the exposure to the actual TTPs that are going on. We also have a limited focus on detection, our analysis, potentially that coordination piece. And here's the dirty secret. It's not really a secret, but it is the, the, the main rub, our challenge. Training is generally the first thing that gets cut. We've got to, get on the, got to get on a plane, that's $1,000. We've got to put you up a hotel for four or five days, that's another $1,000. We've got to spend $7,500 for a training class. We're reaching into five figures real quick. And if I got a team of five to 10, I'm looking at fifty dollars to $100,000 training budget. Market starts to get soft, that's the first thing that gets cut. On the flip side, we also have some limits to what we've done to penetration testing. This is often driven by operational needs of our customers, of, the, of uh, who we're actually providing to. So we'll, we'll do an annual pen test, really, once a year, two weeks, defined scope, produces limited value. I'm boxing you in. If I'm, if I'm an enterprise ISO or a security officer, I may be boxing you in with a limited. This turns into a governance risk and compliance issue. We're trying to check that box, whether it's PCI, high tech, CMMC, whatever the compliance framework is. Hey, I got a pen test report from you know, company X. That's fine, great, you passed. Doesn't matter what's in the report, doesn't matter that all, all we did was to make sure that you can't get in from the enterprise into the PCI environment. No real value. Oftentimes you can't even have your own internal team. Sometimes there's requirements that you have to hire outside. 
How many of you have actually seen the same vulnerability and exploits year after year after year? Company takes it, they look at the report, and they're like, yeah, I understand. And they set it aside. As a result, customers are seeing limited value, but this is often a self-inflicted wound. They're not actually doing everything they can to gain the value of what the red team can bring to the overall table. And that's what we're going to really do is get rid of that is to show that there's actual value, much more value with all of that technical expertise. Let's get out of this GRC mindset and into something a little bit more productive. So this is where we move from a red team engagement or a straight up compliance penetration test into a purple team exercise. Purple team exercise is that red on blue. It's a little bit more complicated, I understand that. But if we move out of a modality of annually, we can get rid of some of these issues. The scoping and coordination, that cost intensive, that dollar figure that we got to put on there. Here's the other thing. Delving right in that, from that compliance exercise into a full-on purple team exercise, most organizations are, are just going to fall flat on their face. So. Presenting a solution of the best of both worlds is really what we want to do here. I think it's important, though, to look at the history of where purple teaming came from, this red on blue paradigm. So if we go back in the Wayback Machine to, to the late 19th century in Prussia, which is now present-day Germany, the Prussians were the preeminent military power of their day. And one of the first to have a truly professional officer corps. And what they did is they used to use a concept called Kriegspiel, or wargaming. And essentially what they would do is they would basically put, pull out the pre-risk board and move various elements on that board to get practice at things like communication, operational efficiency, logistics. Now, the Prussians wore blue uniforms, so their side would always be presented as blue. Whomever they were fighting, the British, the French, maybe the Russians, would always be red, hence red and blue. The U.S. military adopted this in the late 1960s. The U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy conduct purple team exercises, they don't call them purple team exercises, but what, that's what they do at Top Gun, Black, uh, Red Flag. These are all exercises that pit a dedicated red team that follows current threat or adversary activity, and then they rotate their teams in to train against a live opponent. Same thing out in the Mojave Desert. The National Training Center is the U.S. Army's equivalent to this, is there is a permanent force there called Krasnovia. It's a made-up country, but they mimic or emulate the actual tactics and techniques of Eastern European or now Middle Eastern threat actors. And we actually have, have adopted this model into that cyber red team, taking those advanced techniques, that APT threat emulation, and actually are, are executing it to give organizations some semblance of what it would look like. The missing piece in this whole thing is the blue team. The blue team needs that experience of seeing a real threat actor operate and what they actually do and how they do it. So here comes the big piece. This is what's going to be the biggest benefit for the IR team is having a realistic threat actor actually operate in their network. This is from Ender's Game. It's a really good quote, but I think it really does uh, serve very well for the, the actual underlying context, is there is no better enemy than the teacher. Generally, when you do one of these, you have to use Sun Tzu, but I think it's, it, this is actually it captures it much better. If you're able to emulate an a, a actual threat actor, and the blue team is able to, to respond to it, they're much better, much more capable of addressing that threat in real time. 
So to set stage, here's where we are. We want to represent a realistic threat actor. We want to tie red team activity to known TTPs. Get those from cyber threat intelligence sources. We're going to use that penetration testing, but what we're also going to do is coordinate a lot of our activity with the blue team to really test their not only detection, hey, can I see you, but what would I do if I did see you? If you did drop a cobalt strike beacon or other C2 beacon in my environment, yeah, it's great that I saw it, I can see it. What I actually have to do afterwards, that's the thing I need to train. Here's kind of the rub though, not all testing is 100% realistic, right? I can't train Navy pilots by shooting at them with live ammunition. That would be a self-correcting problem very quickly. So the difference between using ICAR or QBOT, that's what we're talking about. Now, what we want to do is get as close to that possible QBOT without actually detonating and, and really destroying our network. Some of the other things to think about, uh, this is the, the pyramid of pain top. Uh, this is by side. And it really does focus on breaking those TTPs out into specifically what you need to do from a threat emulation perspective. We're going to go a little bit more into depth than this. But this is a really good resource to look at. Don't be afraid to use common tools and techniques. I talk about Cobalt Strike, using that combination of Cobalt Strike, PowerShell, and Mimi Cats. A lot of organizations need that exposure. They need to understand what that looks like because that is a very common technique. We're going to look at another one, run DLL32 to do a, a DLL proxy or search order hijacking. All of these things come into play because this is what we see on a constant and never-ending basis. The other key one that we often don't get a, a, an exposure to is that initial access. This is where organizations really should be scoping. Hey, phishing is in play. Live phishing with some sort of exploit is in play because we need to see what that looks like. Because our ESA may not pick it up and our analysts need to be able to analyze an endpoint to see if any of that data, any of those artifacts are going to lead us down the road of identifying our initial access vector. Again, start simple. We're going to talk about a program that actually builds that simplicity. Here's the other big thing, is a continual operational tempo. We're going to move from this two-week exercise into doing this throughout the year. And there's a reason we want to do it that way. And I'll get to that. I also want to push all of that red, red team experience, not just on the technical end, I want to get it all the way into our planning and preparation. We're building workbooks and play, uh, playbooks, workflows, the IR plan, all of that. that. This is where that expertise comes in really handy. Again, that threat expertise and that ability to, to emulate a threat actor or even just an attacker mindset gets us to a much better place up and down what the incident response team does. So this is kind of the model we're going to look at. We balance realism and cost. I can make, say, with a million dollars, something that will really do very well at getting almost to a real incident. I'm just throwing numbers out here, but you get my drift. Really what we want to focus on is a lot of these lower level things. What can we do from a daily, weekly, monthly training plan? So I talked about that continual op tempo. For the IR team and training, this is really where we need to be. We need to hit the four R's with our training. It needs to be realistic. We've spent a lot of time talking about how the red team can provide us a realistic opportunity to see threat actor behavior in real time. It needs to be relevant. And that means we're using the top 20 detections out of the threat detection report or Mandiant M-Trends, some sort of threat intelligence. What is the enemy doing? 
can we replicate what the enemy is doing and actually execute? Needs to be recent. Here's a really good thing about, especially on the blue team, training is like bananas. It's really good, but it goes bad very quickly. So think about this. It's January 2024. January 2nd, you go down to a week-long boot camp, and it is on triage analysis for the blue team. The blue team is going out. I'm sending all of my people out to know how to pull a triage package from a remote system, analyze it for initial access and execution, present that data, and we're all going to try to get this done in an hour and a half. So we got five days of training in January. If I don't drill that team, and it is now October 19th, 10 months have gone by. How much of that have they retained in that 10 months? How much extra time are they gonna to have to go through their notes, or they're gonna go, go through Google and Google what they need to do here? They may understand conceptually what they need to do, but when it comes to what box to check, or what configuration file to use, or how to actually analyze this, they don't necessarily have that. And it needs to be repetitive. We can't just do something once. So this is where the red team can really help the IR team in doing this. So let's start very, very basic, a one hour exercise, and that is evalu uh, evaluating the incident response plan. What we're doing here is we're just trying to understand, hey, is this plan going to work? And all the blue team does is to say, hey, does this, does this look like it's, it's going to work for us? So one of the things that the red team can help us do, if I had two or three people on the red team, is say, hey, evaluate this. Maybe we conduct a pre-mortem analysis. This is something that we recently dropped uh, a Red Canary blog on pre-mortem analysis. This is where we actually anticipate what a threat actor would do that could really derail our plans. So for example, if your incident response plan turns to the business continuity or disaster recovery plan to reconstitute system from backup, and the red team identifies, hey, um, these are online backups, and they're just basically flat files that are sitting on a, on a data lake that you pull from, anybody with access to this could encrypt those as well. That leads us to actually think about what actually is going to, going to happen. So it's that technical adversary, technical slash adversary mindset that I want to leverage to look at an IR plan. So if you're on the blue team or your blue team manager, loop your IR, uh, your IR team in with the red team to evaluate your incident response plan. If you're on the red team, ask, hey, as part of our review, do you want us to go through your incident response plan, see where there's some technical issues, things that threat actors can actually do? This is the, the blog post. If you want to look at a uh, IR pre-mortem analysis, I, it's a really good, it's a short exercise, can take you an hour, hour and a half. Very few organizations, I think, are doing it. It's really actually a handy exercise, and I've, I've done it before. So. We've got that knocked out of the way. Detection and response drills, monthly. So going back to that earlier analogy of that, that training class I sent my team on in January. Let's say I break it out and I say, hey, I'm going to have the red team come in once a month. They're going to have an email. They're going to send it to a testing endpoint. And they're going to try a new initial access vector and execution. They're going to execute something on an endpoint or multiple endpoints against our network. Your job as the blue team is to actually go out there and pull a triage package and find out what happened. So this is where micro emulation comes in. This is where you can use very discrete techniques that don't necessarily encompass an entire kill chain, but maybe focus on one or two techniques. So in this case, maybe you get on an endpoint and you're going to try run DLL32 and maybe you're going to execute a DLL file. Or maybe you're going to use a, a legitimate DLL file to dump the LSAS process. Something like this. This is so, uh, Atomic Red Team is a perfect example or Caldera for this kind of 
adversary emulation. Why the red team is good at this is they have most likely the expertise, access to the tools, and the technical knowledge to actually execute these. You can even do this a little bit further, where you break it out into specific tests. It's to say, I have a piece of malware. I want to see if we're ready for impact. I keep reading about impact it. I'm worried about impact it. My blue team has no experience to impact it. Can somebody help us out here? This is something that, that you might think about. What are some of the actual things that impact it does? What are some of the things that PowerShell Empire does or PowerSploit and actually break those out? If we're doing this on a continual basis, weekly or monthly, we are building in that repetition. This is relevant to where we are. And they've actually touched, the IR team has actually touched their tools and techniques and their workflows within the last 30 days. One of the other things we do is a tabletop drill. This is another monthly exercise. And in this case, what we do is we string a few of those micro emulations together to actually give us a piece of an overall kill chain. So for example, I'm going to get the red team to focus on lateral movement. I'm going to give them access to an endpoint and say, hey, red team, I want you to go out and do some sort of lateral movement. I really don't care whether you compromise credentials and you get into RDP or you're using SMB. Maybe you're using go to my PC. I don't care. I want my team to be able to pull NetFlow and identify that traffic. I want my blue team to work through a workflow there, pull their security event logs and find that 4624 type 10 event log entry that shows them that that IP address you're operating from. And I need them to do that rapidly because if we're at the lateral movement stage of a kill chain, we've got bigger problems than we understand. We are gaining competency and that detection and response and that security team coordination. You go pull log files, you go pull NetFlow, let's all meet back in 10 minutes and see what it tells us. This is that micro emulation and this is a great opportunity for the red team to really show some of the blue team what these actually look like in real time, what they would actually see from an evidence standpoint versus just trying to notionally say, okay, we would just check this, 4624 event log entries, and maybe we see something versus, okay, that's what it actually looks like. Kind of moving out of the technical is a tabletop exercise. Oftentimes I don't see red team members in a tabletop, tabletop exercise. I see the cybersecurity team, the blue team. I see the legal, marketing, X, XCOM, the executive committee, all of those different people in, the, in the, the actual exercise, but I don't see a red team. And this is one of the things that I would drive home. Just your general knowledge and expertise really does help us understand key aspects of an actual threat scenario. So in a tabletop exercise, the blue team is responding to those injects. What would you do if X happened? What would you do if Y happens? So before that red team, uh, before that tabletop exercise, the red team is really handy to help craft the exercise. Tell us what's going on. What have you seen work in past engagements that we haven't thought of? It's a really good question. Is there something we should be aware of? Hey, you, you did our penetration test last year. What should we be aware of that would be a scenario that would actually execute on this? Here's another thing. Focus on countering those incident response activities. Think of scenarios, right? If I'm the, if I'm the CISO, one of the things I would ask the red team is, hey, we're gonna spin up a, a Zoom channel during the course of this incident is there a possibility that you could get into that and actually listen into the Zoom call or the WebEx? That's something that a lot of organizations have a work game out. Something to really consider. Here's another thing that happens during a tabletop. And if you've been there, uh, you know, 
I'd love to hear your war stories, is a key assumptions check. It's generally high level managers assume something. No, that could never happen. These are your key words. This could never happen because of X. That could be a control, that could be a process, that could be any type of key technology that they think is going to stop that. If I'm running, facilitating that exercise, that's where the red team comes in and I say, is that a proof of concept? Could we proof of concept that? Is that possible? Now, generally, if the red team agrees, yeah, that's not possible, that would never work that way, that's a pretty good assumption to make. But if the red team is sitting there doing the, uh, no, that's a very easy bypass, that answer that we're relying on during our tabletop exercise to give us the thumbs up goes right out the window and we've actually gotten some additional value. And generally, I turn that into a microemulation plan or a proof of concept to say, I want my IR team to see what that looks like. Get creative. I talked about the Zoom call. This is an actual real story where an employee uh, basically took the Bitcoin address from the ransomware note and changed it to a uh, cryptocurrency wallet that he controlled. So something like that. What, what, if, what if your systems administrator is so disgruntled that they just don't want to deal with this and they walk out? What if you have an insider? as part of the red team. All of these things from a threat actor perspective really do pull in. And then this is where we get an increased value. This is where we, we're actually gaining a lot more insight and a lot more confidence on the defender side into what we've actually planned. So I walked that up and I said, at, in the middle of this a few, few slides ago, purple team exercises are often rushed. We go right into them. The CISO says, I came from a very progressive organization. We ran purple team exercises every year. It's my brand new team. We're going to do one this year. And they fall flat on their face. I'm not throwing purple team exercises out, but here's the progression. If we're running one of those micro emulation drills weekly or monthly, we're running a technical drill and a tabletop drill once a month. We're doing two to three tabletops at 90 minutes apiece, now the purple team exercise is going to provide that much more value. Because now I'm not using this as a way to say, okay, what vulnerabilities can be exploited? I am using it as a validation exercise for everything we've done the previous year. We talked about the continuous tempo. We talked about relevancy and repetitiveness. The purple team exercise should be the validation for all that hard work that the red team went in to helping the blue team be better prepared for this. And if the red team succeeds, but they don't succeed as much, and the blue team succeeds, but they don't succeed 100%, that's a really good validation exercise. So think about not just doing this discreetly, but ramping up starting this process January 1, and then in December, you're doing your purple team exercise. This is all things that, that can be done leveraging all of that expertise that we have. Again, I talked to us about validation. An emulation plan is really useful. So in that pre-engagement, we're not sitting here looking at, hey, what are, what are the issues from an ex exploitability? But hey, we want to validate that your patch management works really well. But we also want to validate, hey, what are your detective controls and what would you guys do if you, you had to respond to this? That emulation plan is going to go a long way, whether it's APT3 or Shinobi Ghost, whatever the threat actor is we're going to emulate. Let's look at that emulation plan. Coordination. So we need umpires, call them balls and strikes. All right, not coaches. I don't want to be facilitating, and I've had to do this a few times, purple team where the blue team will say, well, what are they doing? It's like, that's not my job. I'm not here to tell you what signs mean what. I'm here to say, this is what they've executed. You haven't found it yet. Or no, that's not exactly what they're doing. During the engagement, execute and respond like an adversary. 
the other key learning point, the final learning point after all of this year-long workup, capture insight from both sides. I'd love, as, say, a defender to hear the red team say, we were frustrated at every turn. That doesn't happen. There's, they might come back and say, hey, we got in initial access. We were able to execute a number of tools. We were in the discovery process of finding where your files are, and somebody did something. You know, isolated one of our endpoints, blocked our communications channel, so we had to shift. The blue side may say, hey, we didn't see anything until somebody said that it seemed like there was a weird mouse cursor on their desktop, and that was the only thing that we saw from uh, a detection perspective. Capture those insights, because that's going to help us move into the next year's training. Here are some ancillary benefits. A lot of this has been about very selfishly, like, hey, how do we improve IR teams? How do we improve overall security? Better coordination between these teams. Even if you're a service provider, right, think about maybe retained hours. If you're a consultant, retaining those hours and say, what I want you to do is budget 100 hours for our purple team exercise per, per individual, but I also want you to budget 20 hours throughout the year where we're going to help you with your IR plan, all of the, the tabletop drills, maybe some micro emulations once a month to really start getting that IR team exposed to realistic threat actor activity. Here's the other thing, cross-training and experience. This doesn't mean you can't sit right next to each other, physically or virtually, doing these things. Because the blue team, one of the true deficiencies that we have, incident responders and defenders, is not actually seeing both sides of an attack. We often see the results of an attack versus you implanting a backdoor you dropping malware and executing it. We see all of the trace evidence of that. But sitting side by side, we're getting a cross training and experience. The red team may pick up and say, hey, that's pretty slick that the blue team can automatically isolate an endpoint. We need to focus on not getting caught. We need to focus on EDR bypassing. Here's another ancillary benefit for the IR team, better confidence and capability across the board. Getting that exposure to constant, realistic threat actor activity builds confidence in our capability. And this really does show a much better governance, risk, and compliance effort versus, yeah, we had a company come in and do a perfunctory pen test for us, and that's the way it is. Here's the big thing. From your perspective, as customers, they see that increased value. This is going to be something it's not about pulling the red team or the blue team together. It's about pulling our customers, our cl clients, our organizations, our leadership to understand that there's much more value in combining these efforts across the year, across all of these different training modalities to build better teams. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. If, yeah, if there are any questions, questions, we'll bring a microphone out to you if you want to raise your hand. Any questions out there for Gerard? Going once, going twice. I'll, I'll be at the... Oh, we got one all the way back. Oh, the okay. Right. Hold on one moment here. Don't hurt yourself. Oh, all right, it's working. Right here. All right, here comes the buffalo mic. Which end? Hello? To... Yes. Are you able to hear me? Okay, excellent. So one of the unfortunate e necessary evils is going to be... Mike, you see this right? Yeah, I can. <laughs> close to the buffalo. Very close to the buffalo. All right. Uh, one good. of the unfortunate necessary evils is um, trying to get some metrics and trying to prove to upper management, especially like, hey, this is deriving actual value from here. It's not something where we can just wait for the next incident to happen or next uh, unfortunate event to so like, hey, this is actually something we covered over in that purple team. What are some of the things that you'd recommend that you've seen work really well for kind of showing the benefit of investing in this? 
Okay, so uh, if, I, if I heard ev everything, the, the questions are around metrics and how do you actually show value and how do you actually do uh, show to the senior leadership that this, this value add is, is, is working? Excellent question. Here's the thing, when you're starting to look at micro emulation, for example, it's very easy to track because you're tracking at the technique level. So something like a MITRE attack spreadsheet going, hey, we ran this test, they detected it, and you know we're good there. The other side is, and we ran this technique that completely missed it, but then they responded. And, and the other key metric you want to pivot off of is how long did it take them to catch that? Or did we have to intervene? Because what I can do is say out of a, you know, let's say conservatively we do 50 atomic drills per year. And of those, I've got 40 that we detected that activity and we're immediately able to shut it down within minutes. But there's 10 things that really do hamper our, you know, there, there's something that we don't have visibility into or we just, we just fell flat. That's kind of the metric that I want to see. You know, say at 90 minutes, we had not caught it. It is, that gives me, say I'm the, the incident, incident manager or the management of the incident response team, that's actually what I want you guys to do for the purple team exercise. <laughs> because then we're going to get much more reps. It doesn't make sense to, hey, uh, Mimi Cats gets eaten every time it pops on an endpoint. Okay, we're good there. It's those, those ones that don't, you don't detect, which is one measurement, and then we haven't seen any signs within 90 minutes, which is another. Then it really gives us something to pivot off of. Does that answer? Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody else? I think we may have a question uh, from Discord. Here we go. All right. So Sergeant Danes says, say your organization has been getting pen tests performed for a good while now, but you're not sure if you're ready for red or purple team engagements. How do you determine readiness to move to the next step? So if I understand that they're asking, how do we go from this kind of penetration testing? Yeah, how, how do you determine? You say, hey, we want to start doing this regularly. What would be a, a milestone or an indicator that you're ready to start? So if you're moving from that modality, the easiest way is to start small, is to start actually bringing much more of this micro emulation. It's less likely to cause a major burp. So for example, a purple team exercise does have the, the risk of actually toppling over some infrastructure. But if you want to move and show value, uh, pick some micro thread emulations you can do and actually execute those, show, hey, you're not detecting this. Going back to that metrics discussion, you're not detecting this, you're not able to respond to it. That will increase like, and this is the modality, that'll show some value bringing it there. It's, that's the technical, the, the actual like, you know, convincing management that this is a way to do it is to actually maybe even in your own lab show hey we can execute these things very quickly and show real value from an evidentiary standpoint from a detection standpoint and actually the blue team actually has something to pivot off of if that makes sense okay thank you very much i have a question for you sure so one of your slides you mentioned uh, seeing the same exploits and vulnerabilities year after year, continuously, hey, we're checking the box. Uh, what would be a good way to break the cycle from that? Well, you need to keep reporting on that or demonstrating in your exercises that this is still here, but what's a way to maybe refresh that into a new view in your exercises so it doesn't look like a copy-paste from the previous report? That's a really good one. So let's say we've got that kind of zombie ex you know, uh, vulnerability that's, that's exploited. I would, if I was trying to convince leadership, hey, we got to fix this, is the first thing we do is that micro emulation plan. Just exploit that vulnerability as, as, a limited, as a limited proof of concept. The next stage is then say, okay, I'm going to have the blue team look at this. It's going to take them hours to even identify this activity. Ask the red team, okay, now the next stage is this is exploitable and what could they do from that? So uh, it's not an easy like, oh, just show them a proof of concept, because you can do that. It's about showing them, hey, it's great to say, hey, this is, this is a, a vulnerability. It's another for them to function with the assumption that we would see it and be able to block that activity. 
And the easiest thing to do is just do a very small purple team exercise and let the blue team, unfortunately, throw their hands up and go, we would never have seen that to really wake up some people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for, for uh, coming to Wild West Hacking Fest. I'll be at the Red Canary booth if anybody has any follow-on questions or wants to get into a little bit deeper dive of discussion. Uh, I'll also make the slides available if, if anybody wants them. So please feel free to hit me up. So thank you very much, everybody.